Good morning, everybody. How we doing? Good. I'm Casey Barnett with uh, the One Million Cups organizing team. We are hearing that there's a bunch of traffic and some accidents on 40 right now, so we know there's going to be a few more people coming in. Um, if you have the opportunity to squeeze in so when they come in, they can get to all the chairs. Uh, we have filled up the room every week for the last four weeks, so if, uh, if there is space next to you, be ready to have someone slide behind you or invite them in when they get here. Um, Real quick, wanted to say thank you to all of our sponsors, for everyone who helps us put on One Million Cups. This is a free event for everyone to come to. We do have, from Frontier, we have, um, they provide us with our space, so if you have any meeting space or any um, needs for meetings or groups or classrooms, obviously they have stuff available for you. We have, um, from NC Idea has helped us out with uh, helping to, to pay for our coffee from Muddy Dog who has supplied it to us and makes it for us every morning so we appreciate that. Um, we get we you how we go through all three gallons every week I think of coffee so that's that's pretty good. So um, we also had to reduce our cup size because you guys drink so much coffee so that's wonderful. Um, we will have a break after our first presenter to refill but now's a good time to do that as well. Um, also want to say thank you to Family, Family Legacy Financial who helps us to do all of our um, all the financial needs that we have as the organization. And we are excited that next week we're going to have two new sponsors that have jumped on with us. So that's awesome. Um, and it's going to help us get some technology. So thank you to them. We will announce them hopefully this week on our Friday email. If not, it will be next week on our Tuesday email. So then let's see. We've got um, today we have one presenter. I'm going to have Krista come up and, and uh, do that presentation. We are also going to do espresso shots afterwards. So if you've been wanting to tell people about what's going on in your world, any help you may need from people who might be in this, in this area, and you want to do it in about three minutes or less, we're going to have an opportunity for you to do that for the second half of our presentation time today. So without further ado, I'm going to have Krista come up and, and do the rest. Oh, kill the music. Yep, I will. Yep. So last call for coffee refill before we get started. Um, just so everybody understands, summers can get a little tricky because we all like to go on vacation. So we've had several uh, presenters already cancel. Um, we're working to schedule them, so just bear with us. We may not always have two throughout the course of the summer, but we'll be back on track in the fall for sure. Uh, we're really pleased to have this morning Sri with Murano. Uh, while if you looked at the website, they've been around for a little bit longer than most of our startups. However, they are still working in stealth startup mode uh, to try and disrupt the auto industry from a supply chain perspective. So Sri, we're really interested to hear your story and welcome. First, I want to introduce my colleagues from the marketing department on our team, uh, Heidi and Rosie. Say hello to everybody here. Uh, and I was going to say, I like to be the solo show. I mean, if there's no one else speaking at it, it's all 60 minutes and I can talk forever. So it's a good thing. Yes. Yes, I got lucky. Um, so what uh, we focus on is primarily helping automotive suppliers reduce their inventory costs. So here's flash news for you guys. There's, there's way too much inventory out there, right? Raw materials, these guys are swimming in inventory. And I think you may have heard this a couple of weeks ago, there was another speaker who talked about too much inventory, and then he, there was a company called PharmaSense, I don't know how many of you attended that, and they talked about inventory in hospitals, and they tried to optimize it. So we're kind of like that, but there's a significant difference between what they do and what we do, and we'll talk about all that. So, but we focus on a couple of different verticals, the food industry and the automotive industry. And automotive industry, I'll tell you from my experience, they have lots and lots of inventory. These suppliers are either sitting on too much inventory, and to be actually precise, what's happening is they are having what we call the problem of bimodal inventory distribution. That's too much of uh, the wrong materials and too little of the right materials. So it's not necessarily too much of all the inventory, all the materials, but it's too much of the, the wrong materials and then too little of the wrong materials, or the right materials. You get that, right? Yeah. 
So, so that's the problem, and we call that, we geeks call it bimodal inventory distribution. And that's the problem we solve. And the way we solve it is kind of different from other companies in those industries. We're not a purely an analytics provider, so we're not an analytics provider, but we also provide ERP software. So how many of you heard ERP? Yeah. So the big names in this industry are SAP and Oracle, and we're the teeny tiny David. And I used to be an IBM for many years, and so I have SAP implementation experience, and I did consulting with IBM and all that. So that led us to start this company. So we have the core ERP module. So this is ERP, if you don't know about ERP, is the most critical part of a company's backbone. For, because we run the entire operation of the company. So we have the finance, the manufacturing, the sales, purchasing, human resources, and of course supply chain innovation. So we have offer all that. So why are we, how are we different from SAP and Oracle? We're different in the sense that First, we're on the cloud, okay? And second, we are a multi-tenant cloud provider. So all these SAP and Oracle that's been installed in millions of companies all worldwide, they're installed on local servers in these companies, right? Whereas we are on the cloud and the cloud provider, we have our cloud in a servers at a, a data center here in RTP, uh, in, in RTP, so that's where we have, and of course we have a disaster recovery in AWS. So we provide that, so when we go into a company and we say we can reduce their inventory uh, and optimize the inventory, the first thing we do is replace their ERP system. And a simple way to explain this is we're taking these companies from landlines to smartphones. So there's a lot more flexibility being on the cloud and lots of flexibility, you can do a lot more things. Imagine this, Could you? can you do the things you're doing on a smartphone on your landline? You just can't, right? So that's the kind of stuff we do. And if you're familiar with Google Waze, it tells you where there's going to be a traffic jam or an accident, and it reroutes you. So think of us along the same lines, and that's what we're doing for these automotive suppliers. So the, the big difference between the company that spoke a couple of weeks ago and us is that we're not just taking the company's data and then giving them some results back, but we also provide the ERP backbone on the cloud and provide the predictive intelligence capabilities to, to help them reduce inventory costs. So let me just pause for a second and see how you guys are able to process all that. Actually pre uh, prevent this in the future, right? Or help the OEMs, uh, the, the Mercedes and all that companies, OEMs, uh, uh, adapt to these kind of things, right? These kind of black swan events. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about uh, and supply chain predictive intelligence as well. Okay, so this happened recently, uh, in early May, uh, this, this factory up in Michigan, there was an explosion and this caused major problems to, like I said, Ford. So Ford's most profitable uh, line is the F-150s. So that's the most profitable line and that was disrupted for at least a couple of weeks because of this, uh, this factory fire. Same case with Mercedes-Benz uh, factory down in Alabama. They were also disrupted by this. So their SUVs, highly profitable SUVs, that line has been shut down because of this factory uh, fire. Okay. So that's costing these guys millions and billions in terms of uh, lost sales and lost revenues and profits. So you're gonna ask, so how can we predict this and stop this with, the soft, with, the, with help these OEMs out with our software? So I have a theory. Things don't happen spontaneously. So these kind of things don't happen spontaneously. There's probably some kind of a data that was resident in this enterprise if shared with the OEMs and supply chain partners would have helped Mercedes and Ford better prepare for this, uh, this kind of a disruption. Does that make sense? It's the lack of visibility that's preventing the supply chain partners from preparing for these kind of disruptions. If there was some kind of a safety violation, which I'm sure there was in this case, prior to this accident happening, if they had the data, or if Mercedes had the data, they could have planned for it, and like Google Waze does, rerouted and had a supply chain backup strategy. Does that make sense? 
So my theory is that these things don't happen spontaneously. And just like Amazon is able to predict when you need the next set of Tide box or Tide detergent, we have the data to predict this because we are able to combine the data from our supply chain partners as well as the OEMs and bring that together, include things like traffic patterns and any safety violations, when their work centers are down, when their machines are down. We're able to do all that and combine all that and predict potential disruptions. So that's the big difference. But at the, the foundation is we have the ERP platform where we collect all kinds of data. Everything from the operational data, the manufacturing data, where the scans, the where, you know, the machinery, what's happening with the machinery, the when the machinery is being updated or being uh, is, is being uh, repaired, all that data is being collected in our system. And with that, we can provide early warning uh, uh, data, uh, predictive intelligence kind of a information to uh, to the OEMs as well as the suppliers. Okay. So this is what we talked about, the bimodal inventory distribution. At the heart of it, so when we go talk to a customer, we don't say we are here to replace an ERP because ERP has had a, such a bad name and bad reputation and, and I, cannot, I cannot tell you honestly that there has been a successful ERP implementation to date. If someone is telling you they've had successfully implemented SAP or Oracle, they're lying to you. Because most of these implementations have been a huge disaster. It's been, oh, it's, it's cost millions of dollars and it's, uh, in terms of the adoption rates, it's really poor. Uh, the usability is, is really bad. I mean, people who have gone through these implementations will tell you that it's, it's usually a disaster. It's very expensive. So when we come in as a smaller company and talk to, to a prospect and say, we want to replace the ERP, the first response is going to be, we don't want to go down this path again. Even though the users really hate it, they would rather live with the pain than switch to a new ERP. And the joke is that when a company tries to implement an ERP, their supply chain partners, the first thing they do is they build up the products and then say, we're gonna prepare for disruption and deliveries from this, the supplier, so we're gonna build up the raw material inventory knowing fully well that there's gonna be a failure. So we don't go talk to these Five minutes? Okay. So we don't go talk to, um, uh, to customers and say, hey, replace the ERP, because the first thing we're gonna say, they're gonna say is no, let's not do that, we don't wanna do this. So we go talk to them about optimizing the supply chain, uh, to the inventory, which we know is gonna be significant. The companies we go talk to, they have, they're sitting on way too much raw material. So too much raw material is bad because it affects the balance sheet and it's not a profitable thing. And we help them improve the inventory returns. And the way we can do that is through better predictive intelligence. And that's what we do. Okay? So that's what the bimodal inventory distribution is. And bimodal inventory distribution, if I can go back to this for a second, is exactly what we showed you, is it's too little of the, the right items and too much of the wrong items. So you wanna be in the middle, and that's what we help get these companies to. And there's a metric for this, it's called inventory returns, and we help these suppliers improve the inventory returns, which means faster in you know, terms of inventory. The inventory is passing through their facility fast, it's not getting stuck in one place, and, and we help them improve their profitability and cash flow. So fundamentally, what we do at heart is we're taking the information from the OEM, the consumer, and the suppliers across the multiple tiers of supply chain, both upstream and downstream, and bring that together and giving the data in a single place, in a single platform. So the ERPs of all these systems, we're bringing all that together, connecting all of them, all of them together, and then in giving them the opportunity to, uh, to have better predictive intelligence, just like Google Waze is doing. They're taking data from all you guys, where you are located on a, on a street, and then from there, being able to predict if there's gonna be a crash, or you need to take a different route, et cetera. So that's what we're doing in the B2B world. So this is what we did for a Honda tier one supplier in South Carolina. So we were able to reduce a million dollars in inventory in four weeks. In four weeks, 
by using this technology. So we're able to combine Honda's data with the supplier's data and help them reduce the inventory on hand. So they were sitting on significant amount of inventory and this was, uh, we were able to do this significant, significant reduction. So in the, in the automotive space, one key requirement is that the suppliers should not shut down the OEM's uh, production line. If they shut it down like the, uh, the Michigan supplier did, it's gonna cost millions and millions, not only to the OEM, but they're gonna pass some or most of that cost back to the supplier. And that could really bankrupt the supplier. So, so what these guys do is just to avoid that, they buy too much inventory and a lack of visibility on the, on the OEM's needs, you know, that, that means they'll end up buying too much, uh, too much inventory, right? So we help them optimize it at, at the same time avoiding shutdowns as that's what we're able to do for the supplier in, uh, in uh, South Carolina. So this is what we did. We were able to converge and merge the data from various enterprises within a supply chain. On the left side is what most companies and supply chains, they're where they operate. And we were to bring these guys to the right side and provide the supply chain predictive intelligence capability because of that. And at the same time, replace their legacy ERP system as well. So this is also something we see very frequently in our, uh, the customers that we see is that there are very few companies where they operate on a level three or level four, or level five, in terms of organizational maturity. Most companies are just shipping products or shipping products and collecting data. And they haven't gone to the level of maturity or sophistication where they can actually predict, improve processes, measure results, that is an exception, especially the small and medium-sized companies. So what we're doing is we're helping these companies get to that stage and we're not just offering them We're not just offering them technology assets, but we're also offering something called Supply Chain Academy, where we're bringing the competence and excellence of these suppliers, right? So we call it Supply Chain Academy, and we're getting the people to go from get, becoming more qualified in terms of supply chain processes, giving them the training, the process orientation. The assets, we provide these uh, Supply Chain Academy concepts, processes, best practices as well. Okay. All right, so I'll stop at this point. Let me look at my time. Um, do we have two minutes? Yeah? Okay, so, so the final thing that I want to kind of highlight is we see a prevalence of Excel and access databases. So one of the indicators of a failed ERP implementation is the amount of Excel spreadsheets and how much they use, in, use ex, how often do they use Excel to kind of complement the ERP implementation. If the ERP doesn't satisfy their basic needs, what people do is they'll dump the data into an Excel and then do all kinds of analysis using Excel. So my goal, personal goal, is to kill Excel in these companies, right? That's what I want to do. I, I want to really kill, someone's clapping. Is that, is that a good thing, you agree with? Yeah. Excel, I'll tell you, is the scourge of these enterprises. Because it's, by the time they get the data to download into Excel, the data is already obsolete and outdated. So that's where we come in. So in our system, we have in excess of 100 reports, standard reports that we offer. And that's the other thing with these ERP systems. Most of the ERP systems don't have the reporting capability that we do. So we have 100 reports out of the box, standard reports that should meet most of these companies' needs. And not only that, we can also provide the predictive part in these reports. So we can predict when these guys are gonna run our raw material so they can calibrate their raw material acquisition. So that's what we offer in terms of, that's my goal. When I die, my epitaph should say, I killed Excel. Excel. <laughs> All right, so I get the warning now saying I'm out of time. So questions now? Yeah. All right, questions, yes sir. I want to ask you about Excel in your tool. Do you have an option to download Excel? <laughs> 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 yes, so we have to be customer-centric. You know, I heard of the interview this morning, the NPR this morning, that 
In 1990, Jeff Bezos said that he wants to be Amazon to be the most customer-centric company. So when customers come and say, we want to download this into Excel, so I can't say no, so we have that option. So I'm sorry, we can have both sides of the world, but we do have that. Yes, thank you. So two questions. Uh, can you tell me what business stage you're at? How, you know, how big are you? How are you funded? Where, what's your, you know, what, some estimate of sales? I'll answer your question, but what's your background? Uh, I was at <laughs> IBM for 30 years and Microsoft for 17 years. What, what do you do now? Uh, now I'm semi-retired. Semi-retired. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to make sure where you're coming from. So where we are, um, as, you, as you can imagine, it's not easy to build an ERP. Like uh, it, it takes some time, right? So from um, where we are in the journey, we're past the stage where uh, the vision and the building, you know, designing the product and all that. So we have a product that's functional, that's used, that's being used in production. People ship products and all that, and they earn a living with it. So it's a fairly mature, stable product. Okay. Yes, you. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, you, you, wonderful presentation of what your product does, but what is your ask of this community? What are you looking for right now for your business model? What, what, what is your interest? And, and what so why, why am I here today? Why are you here today? That's, that's a good question. So we want to get the word out, actually. So, so we're trying to do something special here. And uh, we're, we have a solid product. And we have a tiny David compared to the massive companies and the competition that we have out there, right? So at this stage, what we need is more exposure and uh, market awareness, right? So what I tell our team is that we have more credibility, more uh, capability than what the market knows about. Usually, it's the other way around, right? So we have more capabilities, really robust capability that's functional, that's being used, and it's providing value. And I guess what I need is more, what we need is more exposure and awareness. That's what we're looking for, right? And I really doubt if there's any target market, any, anybody from automotive in this, in this room, I would be shocked. There's probably, uh, probably gonna be no manufacturing companies or automotive companies in this group. But what we're looking for is more awareness and more publicity and get the word out is what we're looking for. Okay. Yeah? Question over here. Yes. Hi, my name is Bill Warner. I'm the chief of manufacturing at Audi. <laughs> <laughs> You try. So I'm, like, I'm like him, I've retired. Okay. But look, uh, my question is related to the last two. Yeah. I'm not getting what your business is. You appear to be a consulting firm yeah. with software assets. Yeah. Good ones, I don't deny that. Yeah. But if you're a consulting business, I wonder how the heck you're going to scale this company to be able to provide all of these services simultaneously with dozens and dozens of customers? So at, at the heart, we are a software company. We're a cloud software as a service provider. Our competition- all those services. Huh? all those services you had on your last slide for that. What's that again? You had a list of services yes. that you provide. It's humongous. If you actually do all of them, it's gonna take all of your time. As long as we get paid, we're, what's the problem with that? And we can provide the value to these companies, right? The question right? Is, is, how do you scale having to do all of that work with people? So the scaling part, uh, see, this gentleman asked the question, where are we? That's what we're trying to figure out at this point. Okay, hurry up. <laughs> That's what we're trying to figure out. That's what we're trying to figure out. So I wish I had a ready answer for that question, but we're trying to figure that out, yes. Yes. So. I graduated from Syracuse University with a degree in transportation and distribution management. Yes. Okay. Yes. 1991. Yes. I saw yes. all the same stuff presented to me at that time. Yes. Which is now all called supply chain management. Yes. It's merged and whatever. Yes. So either my professor was way ahead of his time. Yes. Or everybody today who's working in these indus the industry you're targeted is yes. so backwards. Yes. I don't know what to believe. So, you know, help me understand here. I'm getting a little, 
you know, confused and, yes. and, and you know, maybe this is that part of what you need to do is really hone in and focus on where is it that you're making an impact? Yes. Because some of the, the supply chain is a pretty sophisticated thing. So I find it hard to believe that yes. all the people who work in it are weak links, which is essentially what you're telling us. Yes, uh, so I will go to that slide. Uh, Casey, could you forward that slide? Is the, is the clicker on? Click on. Okay, let me just answer your question. So I'll tell you the fundamental problem is Chris, can you fast forward? Yeah. Let's fast forward to the bunch of circles. Um, just hit the arrow over, yeah. Yeah. Stop, yeah, right there. Yep. Yeah, that one. So the problem is on the left side, that's the fundamental problem. So all these companies are sitting on islands of data that don't talk to each other. That's the fundamental problem. And where we come in is a connected enterprise. That's what we offer. We're able to connect all these circles together. Even within an enterprise, I'll tell you, there are islands of data that don't talk to each other. It's a massive problem. And that's exactly why these companies are struggling. And so your professor in 1991, he was a visionary, he was speaking ahead of times, but the reality is even today, 30 years later, that it's on the left side, that's where we are. So where we come in is provide that on the uh, get the solution, get these companies to the right side. You should start with this slide. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Yes. 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 I'm the uh, guy that gave the PharmaSense presentation that, uh, oh, okay. uh, that, that you found uh, wanting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I, I believe there are a lot of weak links out there, yes. by the way. <laughs> um, have you thought about partnering uh, with other companies who may use your technology, like mine? for example, uh, and I'm interested actually. Yes. I'm skeptical when, yes. when you tell me that you're gonna you know, go roll out new ERP systems yes. and establish suppliers, I'm highly skeptical. Yes. But I can imagine using bits and pieces of what you're talking about yes. in an offering you know, in healthcare. I have deep domain expertise yes. in that vertical, yes. but, um, but I see the weak links. Yes. Absolutely, Jim, so we are looking for partners, but we have historically found that Finding customers and acquiring customers is easier than finding partners and investors. So that's why, because I have a sales background, so for me to sell to customers has been easier than selling to investors and partners. So that's why we've gone down that, gone down that path of least resistance in my life. But, but I, we're open to partners as well. Well, hell, I need you then. I might get a customer to be difficult. Okay, yes. Yes, ma'am. Hello again. Um, one I want to add is that uh, the industry that I'm working in right now is in the, very much the dark age. They probably produce you know, billions of dollars a day in revenue, and they still use a clipboard to check people into work every day. So to, to add to that, and one of the problems we find is the connectivity of the APIs. You yes. know, that none of their equipment is connected. Yes. Our own cities here, they have that problem. They have great sensors everywhere, data coming in from four yes. or five different vendors and no yes. way to link them. Yes. But good for you for wanting to come out of the box and yes. change the world and, yes. and try to get us to use something else besides Excel. Congratulations. I want to talk to you afterwards. Okay. All right. So one thing uh, before I thank you, one thing I wanted to mention was that SAP and Oracle, they just provide this circle. What we are offering is an ERP for supply chain because we're on the cloud. It's a multi multi-tenant cloud solution. So I haven't I didn't mention that because it throws people off. So we can essentially connect an industry together with our platform without any kind of APIs and all that. That's that's what we have. I don't know if you'll let you think that, uh, process that. Yes, yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, um, how does this relate to uh, Toyota's production system? Uh, uh, is that a, a competing approach or a complementary approach? Uh, so was in it, terms of yeah. case flow and so forth? Yes, so, so let me go to this slide right here. So Toyota production systems, all that comes in this stack right here. So that's complementary to the technology offer that we offer, okay? So that's complementary. The TPS would be in the best practice stack. And our solution will complement that, is what we're saying. 
Okay. So when you combine both, best practice and what I tell our customers, you can have the greatest uh, technology asset, but if your processes suck, then it's no good. So they come back and tell us, and we say, you gotta go to a more, a better process. And so be best process, ideal process, with the great technology is, is, a, is a perfect solution. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, just a real quick question. Do you have an example of a test run where you've actually um, done your entire procedure and seen results in the company? Yes. This this is an example that we're talking about. This is a supplier, Honda supplier, tier one supplier in South Carolina. So we actually see them. We replace your legacy uh, ERP system with our system. So they use our software, they come in the morning, they log in, process the orders from Honda, the Honda orders comes in via EDI, so we process all that, and then they're able to uh, get the products out, send the ASN, scan the products, receive the products, scan the products to get it out. All that happens to our, our platform. Yeah. So it's the backbone of their business. Very mission critical. So it is mission critical software, that's what we're talking about. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to get the mics coming. So in this case, how did you get the supplier to rip out their existing ERP system and replace them with yours? That's a selling part. <laughs> That's a secret sauce, yes. <laughs> no, so if you, uh, this is a complex software sale. It's uh, selling something like this is not easy because they're trusting their guts of the operation with a supplier like us. And the second thing is that they're gonna trust their data with us because we're a cloud provider. So that's the complex sale. So very complex. Yeah, it's not an easy answer. Yeah, it's a very complex. But that's what we do. That's what we're coming. Yeah. Okay. We have a question right here. Yes. Um, this is not a little bit um, <laughs> Like, how do you just uh, mention that uh, you don't rely on APIs and uh, you're relying on EDI, you know, primarily to get data from the other ERPs? Is that a sustainable approach? Because as we look at many other applications, especially in the cloud APIs, drive the connections between systems. I know SAP and others are data from Honda and getting data from USPS and DHL, etc. But in terms of that, exposing our data, we haven't done that yet. Okay. So it might happen, I don't know when, but it might happen. Right here in the middle? Yes, sir. Yes, hello there. Um, I'm gonna go back to Excel because um, I don't okay. think that's the place to be. Okay. Why kill it? Why don't you just join up with it? <laughs> Make an ODBC, con uh, uh, ODBC connection too, it's so that uh, people can use what they're already familiar with, as opposed to learning something new and having to uh, start from the beginning. So fundamentally, data is not static, it keeps changing. So as soon as you get something into Excel, the data is obsolete. But you've got an ODBC connection, so yeah. it's always static, it's always immediately there. Yeah. It's the same data you're presenting in your, yeah. your program. So let's just step back and ask, what's the function of an application like ours? We have to provide a business value. We have to be able to uh, spot a trend or predict what's gonna happen in the future. And it'd be like asking, why, why can't we put Google Maps on Excel or Google Waves on Excel kind of a thing, right? So if we can do the same thing in our application to give them the, the value to- You could do that. Yeah, so- You so, can put Google Waves in Excel. Huh? Because I'll tell you what our customers can say, I don't want to download this into Excel and you know, I want to see all this in one place. I mean, the executives are now going to say, I want to use an iPad or a phone to see what the trend is. They don't want to go, that's what they're saying. My, my question is, why don't you just make it so that they open Excel and they just get your data? They get all of your, your analytics. So we do that, yeah. We, we do that already. So we let them export to Excel. No, they don't want to export it. They just want to connect to it. Open Excel, your file is right there. Maybe I'll think about it. Yeah. I'll think about it. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. I would just say. Yeah, I just say, picking the fight with Excel is the wrong fight. You, yeah. I mean, I get your point about yeah. it's dynamic data. Yeah. Excel is yeah. often used yeah. for static data. Yeah. It's clipboard reporting. Yeah. 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 The point. I think what will be really interesting is to understand how, what segments you're going after as well. I know you said automotive. Yes. Um, 
But these ERP systems are deeply entrenched yes. in the big companies, yes. right? And they're yes. millions of dollars, and they yes. are in the cloud. Yes. And I'm not sure multi-tenant is the big advantage. I see, yes. But I do suspect you've got like a real vision for integration, yes. multi-supplier integration, yes. Yes. and that you could go after specific segments really yes. successfully. Yes. Yes. I'd love to hear more about what your real advantage and focus is, because you painted a fantastic picture. Yes of a huge shovel going through a deep bank or so, yeah. and I yes. think that there's a more focused approach possible. Yes. People love to hear it. Yes. So going back to your question, now, that's why I said, we don't go in and say we're gonna replace your ERP, we're here to save inventory costs. So that's the first thing, so we don't, because exactly as the gentleman said, the companies don't want to go down this path again because they know it could be uh, right or wrong. They could be a very disruptive process, so they don't want to take that risk. No one of these enterprises really want to take the risk of replacing the ERP. That, they don't want to do that. So we go and talk about supply chain optimization and cost savings and bolt-on solutions and then get the foot in the door and then go from there. But in some cases, we go in and replace the ERP as it as is because if there are, there are a ton, ton of it, ERP providers that are either dying or not keeping up with the code latest and greatest, so these guys want to move off those ERP vendors, right? The legacy ERP vendors. And that's what we see as a low hang. That's one target market for us. But in other cases, we go after these bolt-on solutions where we provide complementary solutions. And our value proposition is that we're not just providing technology assets, but we're actually giving them cost savings, demonstrable cost savings. That's what we're offering them. So that's what we're trying to uh, attack. And we can talk more about this later. Yes, sir. Early in the presentation, you mentioned the food supply chain, the yes. food industry. Yes. So obviously different from automotive, yes. spoilage yes. is a majorly consideration. Track trace, yes. Okay, and yes. obviously your, one of the things that you put here as a strength is yes. having the right stuff, the right amounts of the right stuff at the yes. right time. So yes. obviously spoilage is gonna be more even uh, yes. weighted in that yes. equation. Yes. So to build on something he said, yes. What is your thinking about taking a focused approach yes. on ho like what sort of a problem in terms of cost yes. would you be solving in the food distribution network yes. and where could that be you bringing people up to, to speed on, on those savings? Because I think that would be extremely impactful and yes. a, a heavy uh, point of sale for you. Yes. So th yes, that's a good point. So food industries, the biggest problem they have is the food traceability and recalls. So that's the biggest problem and they don't want to have an FDA inspection. So what we provide out of the box is the food traceability, traceability capability. So they, if they have a finished product, they want to know what lot numbers went into that finished product from a raw material perspective and we give that out of the box. So that's our value proposition. We give that out of the box to these food manufacturers. Okay. So that's that's what they care about. So the auto industry, they don't care about that as much as the food industry. The food recall, that's a huge issue. They want to be able to trace that down the supply chain and we're able to provide that. The auto industry, they don't ask much, not for all the parts, but for some parts, they need that kind of traceability. But we are able to share some of that across these industries, but for the food, we have that special special capability. Did I answer your question? Uh, kind of. But, it, but you, you actually brought up something interesting, and it yes. sounds like your real specialty is tracing defects. Whether it be automotive or it be sport, uh, you know, E. coli, if that's that, where you're getting at, I think that's what you should be talking so, about. So uh, that's one of our capabilities. So we are not, you cannot put us in a box and say this is one kind of a single one-trick pony solution, that we're not that. But we have extensive capabilities, and we have 240 screens. Most of it's used in production. We can do everything from quality to scrap to finance to reporting to manufacturing in barcode scanning. So there's a lot of ex it's extensive capabilities. That's when Chris has said we're not a we're not a young startup. It's a fairly mature product, and we cannot be in production with. So that's so we have a lot of diff different things. So we're not a one trick pony. We can't be really, you know, classified as a single solution provider. So that's one big difference. So so a lot of capabilities, right? So that's what we are. Yes, sir. You had a question. All right. Yes, sir. I'm going to piggyback off yes. of that. Um, this is not working, so I'll just yell. It is yes. working. Oh, it is working. Oh, okay. um, traceability. Yes. Is that a, a strong feature in the software? And when I say traceability, the ability to um, document where materials are coming from, who's producing them, yes. you know, the efficacy. Yes. Because that is huge, not yes. so much in the U.S., but in Europe and other places yes. for sustainability. Yes. You know, 
allows you to conduct business. That's yes. huge. Yes. And Answer is absolutely yes. And a feature that yes. is not in the most ERPs. Yes. And so, that is a yes. thing that we have to use Excel for. Yes. So the answer is yes. So we have lot numbers and batch number capability that's built in. We can trace it back. If they ship the finished products to a customer, we can find out how many customers have it, who has it. So if a recall from a supplier happens, we have all that capability out of the box. So it's all, it's all standard feature. Yes, there's one more question. Yes, sir. We've recently been hearing about a four letter, new four-letter word called tariffs. Yes. Um, does, does your program um, Look, look at the impact of tariffs, because you're talking about the food industry, the sheet metal industry, and auto parts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, okay, all of a sudden tariffs are announced. Would your program show what the impact of that might be, or, or have you not? So I'm a sales guy, I'm going to say, yes, it's possible, everything's possible. No, but I'd be lying if I said that, no. So that's one area we have we don't cover, okay? So I'd like to say yes to everything, but no, the answer is no to that, yep. So tariffs is no, but supply chain risks, that's what we focus on, okay? All right, any other questions? All right, we have one last question. One last question, okay. Okay, um, I've, I'm impressed with everything that you're doing. I, I think you got really grilled here, which I think is what this is all about. Yeah. I mean, to I'm used to it, it's okay. This is not compared to what I go with the customers, deal with the customers, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, sorry. And the, I wanna go back to the one trick pony yes. comment. Uh, yes. Obviously you can do a lot, but yes. as a startup, yes. um, you need that focus. Like, yes. you, that's your way in. If yes. you can, I, if I, my suggestion would be just keep all of this in your back pocket. Yes. I mean, if you can't go and try to compete with these ERP systems, yes. you need to get in the door. Yes. You need to get a foot in there. Yes. yes. And once that's in there, then you can yes. blow up. Yes. I mean, you're not IBM. Yes. So I, I can see how you would feel that way. You do a lot. You're a very impressive man, but yes. focus. Is yeah, I think that's a good point. Yes, focus is important. That's what I tell my team. Focus is important, so that's good advice. Yes. Yes, any other questions uh, before I turn it over to Chris? Just yes. Uh, final, final question. Yeah, final question. I, yeah. I, 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 hold on, hold on. I have a question about sales. Yes. Um, so hold that. Hold that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we went all the way to the We've been talking a lot about what actually you provide the value. And I'm a salesperson. Yes. So, um, and um, I used to work for a consulting company in California that automotive and manufacturing were two of the verticals. And it seems that your two verticals, yes. you concentrate on based on your website are automotive and the pet food industry. Yes. Okay. Well, so, the food industry. Well, the food, yeah. food, food industry. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand, um, you, how are you going out and getting your clients? How is your marketing team going out and generating um, demand? Are you out in the marketplace? Are you going out to trade shows? You talk about you need more exposure. Who are you putting on the street? What is your sales? process or focus and we're going out and going out and making sure that the people are aware of you yes so uh, that's a good, good question in terms of what's our um, what's our uh, go-to-market strategy that's what we're talking about right so the question the go-to-market strategy so we've been doing this for some time so we have a network we've been talking to uh, we go to events for example but then we all, when we go to events the first time you start going to events pretty much everybody is new right but then now when we go to events, you know, we have people we've worked with before, met with before, someone we know, the degree of separation is just one or two, right? If there's a six that we, we initially start off with. So there's some of that. So the, as time goes by, more and more investment into this business development process and business, the market, uh, go to market strategy, the investment we make, we're seeing, it's not just a cold calling thing, right? So I don't, we don't do cold calling. So it's, it's the relationships and with the supplier, the referral business, all that, you know, the Honda refers us to other people, other suppliers. That's what we're, that's what we're experiencing, Grant. That's where we are in our, in our evolution. So you have a referral, basically you're being referred by the, by the, yes. by the, you know, by the, by the automakers. The automakers, and when we go to events, is we know people there, they say, hey, you know, why don't you talk to so-and-so, and so, so our supply customers themselves will refer us to other customers, yes. So I'm I'm in right now, and I'd like to expand. I'm in right now. I'd like to expand, but uh, yes. So hiring an enterprise salesperson is not easy. So we need to have somebody with a complex sale. If you hire somebody from a bigger company, they'll have, they'll expect a huge marketing infrastructure. On the lookout for that. So, we'll, but we need the right kind of person who can scale down as well as scale up and step into various roles. Right. So that's what we're looking for. At this point, I'm going to before Chris. Uh, 
throws me out. <laughs> it's related if it helps. Last, last, last. <laughs> uh, related to what she was asking, what is, what is the size of your team currently? So we're roughly 10 to 12 people, uh, a combination of full-time uh, contractors and uh, a couple of interns. So that's where we are. We hire a lot of uh, folks from NC State, industrial engineers who we, we hire from in, uh, NC State. So this is where we're different from other software startups. We don't have computer science people purely, but we have industrial engineers helping us. They, they transform themselves into computer science people because they can talk the language of these, uh, these uh, manufacturing people, right? So that's, that's, our, that's our team, okay? All right, before Chris that... throws me out, I'll turn it over. Thanks. Thank Chris. you very much. All right, everyone, we're gonna open it up to what Casey has introduced.